Welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator, where we discuss how real estate brokers can accelerate their growth by improving their agent recruiting and retention. I'm your host, Jim Turner, and today we'll discuss growth tactics with our special guest, who is a subject matter expert in the industry. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Jim Turner, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of BrokerKit, and I'll be your host today. Today on the show, we're super excited to have Lisa Chinati, an experienced vet in the real estate space in the Massachusetts area. Lisa, welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator. Oh, thanks for having me. Super stoked. Let's just start out with your background. How long have you been in the business? How did you get into real estate? And then how did you work your way up to um, broker owner? Love that. I got into real estate quite by accident. And I always tell folks I started way back in 2004 and got a real estate license after I had my first daughter and became a stay at home mom when realizing that stay at home momming wasn't a hundred percent for me. But I also quickly found myself a in that 85% failure rate in between 2004 and 2006. I never sold a single home. I let my license expire and back into the industry in 2010, also quite by accident. In 2010 to 2014, I was a very part-time agent selling one or two homes a year, folks that I would meet at open houses or friends in town who were looking to buy or sell. In 2015, when both my kids were a little bit older, I jumped in a little bit more full-time and that year I sold eight houses, which is amazing when you go from selling one or two. And then 2016, my uh, CPA had a conversation with me and said I either needed to admit it was a very expensive hobby or I needed to actually earn some money and stop writing off my losses. And so I jumped in with both feet in 2016 and sold 82 homes as a solo agent. And then 2017 started- so busy my, year then? <laughs> it was, yep. There was not a lot of balance, for her, but don't know that there ever really is when you're in real estate. 2017 started my team. 2019 opened the brokerage. And so in November of 2019, and then March 2020, when COVID hit, there were some real big thoughts of what did I just do? Um, it turned out to be probably the best decision that I ever made. Great. Thank you for the background there. So here at BrokerKit, we focus on the talent funnel, and that's kind of the purpose of this podcast is really to talk through that. What's working out there you know, with practitioners in the marketplace? Most brokers are super focused on that sales funnel, but less so on the talent funnel. And we believe that's the way to really bring scale to your business is surrounding yourself with a, you know, a fantastic team that knows how to produce. Maybe just tell us where you are now in terms of like how many agents do you have now and where do you want to be in 12 months or maybe at the end of this year? It's a, a fantastic question. So we're at uh, somewhere between 150 and 160 agents actively productive on our roster. Our goal is to get to 250 by the end of 2024. So some pretty big goals, but I think that they are totally attainable. And to your point, I think 110% the way to grow revenue is through agent attraction. I think one of the Biggest epiphanies for me when I was a team leader before I even opened the brokerage was understanding as a team leader, we can chase $10,000 commission checks or understand the lifetime value of an agent who's in production in terms of company dollar. And for us, that's around $225,000. So we can spend the time marketing and attracting clients for $10,000 commission checks, but we weren't spending an equal amount of money in our P&L attracting agents who are lifetime value much higher for the company. You get an award because you are the first person that is, I have heard use the term of lifetime value and agent, which I have used and I have a specific webinar around it and a calculator to calculate that. Did you by any chance see that? You, you I did have. not, no. Okay, interesting. So I have a whole calculator and I did a whole webinar exactly on this topic, how to calculate that. You, I'm super impressed that you know those numbers and you're maximizing it. But at the end of the day, that's the value proposition of focusing on the talent funnel versus the sales funnel is Correct. that ratio of what it costs to acquire an agent versus what they are worth across their lifetime can be very high yeah. if you do things right. The gain to your business relative to the amount of effort can be much lower than focusing on sales, right? Correct. So if you go back to that year, you were super busy with all those transactions. What was it in the 80s? 82, yep. Right? So if you flip that and you focus on hiring agents that bring in the 82, you know, you can potentially get the exact same result with a lot less effort, right? Is that is that kind 100%. of what you're saying? 
Yeah. Or if I look, if you look at it and spin it the other way and say 82 transactions at an average of $10,000 a check, right? We're talking $820,000. Or if we say 82 agents net effective at even $200,000, like over a lifetime of an agent, the numbers are catastrophically different or astronomically different. And you'd be amazed how many people do not know those numbers, by the way. I've asked pretty senior people in quite large brokerages that don't know those numbers. And many of them are focusing on acquiring via growth because they don't realize the ROI is actually much higher to focus on organic if, if, they, have, if they have the capabilities. You know, look, tell me, like, what is the strategy to differentiate your brokerage relative to other ones out there and to attract those agents? And I love the word attraction versus kind of recruiting, right? Because life is certainly much easier if you're attracting them. Like what sets your brokerage apart and how do you explain your value proposition to agents? So what sets us apart? I mean, one, we, it, it was interesting. We operate on EOS. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, the entrepreneurial operating system off the book traction. And this year at our, or last year in 2023 at our annual offsite, we actually made a pivot and it was a fascinating pivot where we transitioned from recognizing that we were a real estate sales company servicing buyers and sellers to a training and lead gen company. And we changed our entire mission statement in order to to match what we're doing, which is to have 100 agents in a single year who each earn more than $100,000. Um, and again, through lead generation and training, but also culture um, is a big part of it. We are not anything like a traditional real estate office. Uh, we're a large open space where people are prospecting and we're non-competitive. We are inappropriate in a lot of ways in that it's just funny and nobody takes themselves too seriously. And it, so a big part of it, lead gen is obviously one that's always going to be a magnet for some agents, right? Especially in this environment where often opportunities with consumers who are actually looking to transact despite interest rates or despite low inventory or whatever is super important for agents. Training being the other part of it where especially, again, given where we are in terms of the industry with what's going on with all of the buyer agency and the future of listings and that kind of stuff, training becomes the other part of it. And then culture in that, you know, I think one of the things we've learned through COVID as we come out of it on the other side is that people want connection and you know, being able to feel like they have a place. So those are our three big things. I love it. And by the way, super familiar with EOS. It's a recurring theme, by the way, on these podcasts. And it's something that we follow ourselves at BrokerKit. Um, <laughs> uh, awesome. so very, very familiar with that. And uh, we're actually in the middle of moving it into the 90.io software. Uh, we've used 90 for about two years now, and it's amazing. Are you self-implementing? Do you have like an implementer that you've engaged to help you with that? And do you have an integrator, I guess? And for those of you that that sounded foreign to, check out the book Traction that Lisa mentioned. It's it's kind of a the first in a series of books on EOS, but it is it covers all this. Yeah, uh, we have an amazing implementer who's been working with us uh, since the day we started. Uh, I think we recognized quickly that the value of her role in the organization far surpasses what we pay her and her ability not just to implement help us implement eos but her ability to help us navigate the difficulties that come with personal relationships and hard conversations and all of that stuff uh, and just being able to be a separate set of eyes is super relevant we're also very lucky if you will in mass we pay a lot of taxes but we also get a lot of employee retention stuff. So the state of Massachusetts has actually given us a grant that funds all of our annual EOS fees for our implementer, which has been amazing. a huge benefit. Yep. And I do have an amazing integrator who wouldn't be able to do it without her. She's phenomenal. So now tell me more about the state grant. Uh, now that's made me curious. Maybe I live in Colorado. Maybe I need to do a little research here. Yeah, it's an employee workforce education grant. And so they view the time spent offsite with EOS as a way to engage our employees and help them continue their own uh, professional development. So they write us a check for $6,000 every quarter to pay for our offsite fees. Brilliant. I learned something really new there. And so did all of the listeners. Then let's just talk about like, what is your, you know, that's kind of your culture, your core values, your organization, you know, where, yep. where you want to go. So what's the ideal agent profile that you like to hire to kind of 
fit within that and why? Yeah. Well, so we are, we have a bunch of different avatars, right? So probably 50% of the folks that we hire have never sold a home. They're brand new to real estate. And we're really uniquely set up to help those folks through really great training, a ton of support and lots of coaching. And then obviously the lead gen side of it. Other avatars, kind of what we're focusing on right now are agents who were on teams and left teams, but found that they didn't have all the tools and skills that they needed in order to really make it as a true solo producer. We're looking at, for us, it's agents who've sold less than 10 homes in the year prior and less than 4 million in volume. I'm a big believer that our business model doesn't go well for folks who've got an established book of business and also lead by never going to make an, make an ask of an agent to join the brokerage if I'm not 100% confident that I can help them sell more homes, earn more money, and help them while doing it. And anybody selling over $4 million, $5 million, we may actually risk disrupting their business and causing a decrease in production because clearly where they're at works well for them. And so how do you, how do you find these people? What are your sources of kind of recruiting leads, so to speak? So I have an epiphany probably about six months ago that recruiting agents or attracting agents is very much in line with what real estate agents or brokers did to build their listing business. And so everything that we do on recruiting has a direct correlation to what we do to attract sellers who would transact with us on that side of things. And so we have a pretty deep lead gen structure in terms of recruiting that involves, you know, understanding the avatars and then all of the pillars. So direct mail is definitely a piece of it. Cold calling is definitely a piece of it. Running ads through the job boards is definitely a piece of it. Google display ads that pop up after retargeting is definitely a piece of it. YouTube pre-roll ads, again, stealing traffic off of places where we know agents are likely to go when they're looking for more is definitely a piece of it. Our Instagram and Facebook stuff is definitely a piece of it. When we lead with who we are and what we offer and then put it all together, it's so powerful. But understanding that much like, again, going back to your listing business, you would never have just one lead pillar or one source and you're never going to totally attract a seller just with one phone call or just by sending them one postcard. We've got to come at it from all different angles in order to get the brand recognition. These days, you really got to cut through the noise, right? With multi-channel, multi-touch outreach to folks. That's great. So you talked about kind of the profile in terms of, or the avatars you're looking for, but when you talk to people, what are the personality traits or tells, you know, it sounds like you're hiring us, especially a lot of new agents. And as you know, the attrition is quite high in this business for new agents. What are the personality traits or specific parts of their background that you think are a tell as to folks that are likely to kind of work out, especially if they're newer agents? It's so crazy, right? Because there's times when we're like, this person has everything that we've ever looked for, and then they never make it. Like, oh, what did we miss? And then times where we take a risk on someone where we were all like, oh, I don't think that that person's going to sell. And man, they end up being some of the best agents you've ever met in your life. So I take a little bit more of an approach to give more people a try than we maybe should, right? Just because you never know. And I also go back to my own background being, who knew? right? Like if I ever reflected back on who I was, the odds that I was ever going to sell 80 houses a year, grow a team, or even own a brokerage were like, God, probably could have blown some people over with a feather by telling them that that would happen. But so the the big ones for us are that they have to be able to sell full-time. And that doesn't mean that they don't have another job, but somebody who says to us right away that they think that they can do it just on nights and weekends, that's a hard pass for us. If they say to us that they have another part-time job that's say two days a week or three days a week, we can often get a little bit creative to make that work. But from the other side of it, truth be told, the way that our business model works, if somebody's not really looking for leads or opportunities, it's probably not going to be the best fit for us um, because of how we work. And, and a big part of what our value prop is, is our relationships on the lead gen side. So if somebody who's looking for leads is definitely there. They've clearly got to be coachable. They've got to have a great um, phone presence and be able not be afraid of the phones because uh, it is still sales and phone calls are a huge part of it. Professional attire, but the definition of that is very different, right? Like we're not a suit and tie kind of office. And because we serve such a wide range of area from downtown Boston all the way out to the suburbs, there's, again, huge disparity in what professional means in each of those different markets. 
value training, kind of always having a growth mindset and being willing to learn new things. Those are the big ones. But age range, we've got everything from 18 year old kids to mid 60s, maybe even older when I ask after a certain point, but and everything in between. So you talked about who is a fit and, and in some cases who's not a fit. How do you handle the conversation on folks that maybe aren't a fit and do you qualify them out? It's, it's obviously if you had a corporate job where you're paying a salary, maybe your own staff, you tend to weigh things a little differently, you know, compared to bringing on an agent who's an independent, you know, contractor who's commission based. Obviously, they do bring some overhead, but not as much as a full time staff. How, how do you handle that situation when folks are maybe not the best fit? Before they're in or after they're in? Maybe both. But good, good angle there. Good redirection. Uh, be- <laughs> Before they're in, it's a, it's an, it, you know, a very honest conversation, and I say it probably at least twice a day in my phone calls, which is, you know, Jim, I just want to be fully transparent that we may not be the best brokerage for you. And one of the things that I know is because we don't charge annual fees or desk fees, the only time that we make money is when you as an agent sell a home and make money. So therefore, you know, we're super cognizant that if we're making an ask for you to join the brokerage, that we believe with a high level of certainty that we can help you sell homes and be successful. And given whatever the scenario is in that particular instance, I'm not sure that we're the right fit for you. But what I'd love to do is refer you to an agent, a brokerage, a team or whatever that might be the right fit for you. Do you mind if I, you know, take your cell phone and pass it along and have this person reach out to you directly? So that's the phone call where they're not the right fit or even after an in-person interview. I I like it. So I went through some training once where I've been through training on a bunch of different sales methodologies. One was they were focused on going for the no, meaning start out by you know, having them prove why they're a fit versus the other way around. Because a lot of people, if you if you assume that they're not a fit, a lot of people will actually take it upon themselves to prove why they are and essentially close themselves. How many people, when you say that, try to push back and say, no, actually, I am a fit. Like, and here's why. You know, very few. I, I'm a very okay. direct person. And <laughs> like, I'm very direct. And you don't necessarily feel an opening where you can, it's not like a, do you think I'm right? Or it's a, this is kind of how it is kind of thing. So I've I've never had anyone push back. Go for the no to get the no, I guess. (laughs) You found these people, you start a conversation. How do you convert a lead into kind of a, a qualified appointment, so to speak, a recruiting appointment? Do you have them in your office? How do you start that conversation? Just how do you How do you kind of move them through the funnel, so to speak, to that phase? Yeah, I mean, it's a conversation on the phone. I think just like anything in sales, the phone call is super, super important, right? We're engaging through a bunch of avenues to get on the phone, whether it's an Instagram message, a text message or whatever, getting on a phone call and really just having a conversation. And I think it's them learning about us just as much as we're learning about them. But then the wrap up is always, you know, quite simply that, often the best way for both of us to decide if this is going to be a fit is for us to meet face to face where we can not just tell you who we are, but show you who we are and see if it's something that you feel comfortable with. And if we agree, we set probably five to 10 appointments a week, depending on how much time I've got invested into agent attraction that particular week. And how do you run that appointment? I mean, so they come into the office. Fun fact, I make all of my recruiting calls on my sales floor in front of my agents. Super, We're super transparent across the board and actually have found that, A, it gets the agents kind of on board and excited. They're kind of hearing the objections and sometimes kind of like making some fun comments and that kind of stuff, which is interesting. Or they'll say, oh, my God, that person has no idea or whatever. But I think also given where we are in terms of the market, I think it's super important that my agents see that I still prospect and understand that I'm still building a business the same way that they're building their businesses. It's just that the target demographic is maybe slightly different where they're calling buyers and sellers. I'm calling agents to have those conversations. And so they see me out prospecting right alongside them. And I'll often say if I'm prospecting, you are too, and invite them to join in for their you know, daily phone calls as well. And then so when those agents come into the office, most of the time it's an open door conversation or we're sitting right on the sales floor and kind of chatting about who we are and what we do. We run with the same commission split for every single agent, regardless of tenure or experience or anything like that. So I think that that transparency is super important to get our current agent community bought into growth because there's times when growth can be scary, especially in a market that is as maybe volatile as it is right now. 
And so the fact that our current agent base sees that and gets a feel for who's coming in, I think is definitely one part of it. We then have the recruits jump into a training and sit through it. And we're kind of watching to see, are they engaging? Are they paying attention? Are they texting on their cell phone? Are they asking questions or that kind of stuff so that we can gauge how comfortable they're going to be in the environment in general? And then we have a wrap-up meeting. Sometimes we'll drop them over with our inside sales team and have them do some role play. Because again, phone calls are such an important part of it for us here that if they're not comfortable role playing, it's probably, again, not the right fit. And then we meet and we kind of chat about where we both see whether there's opportunity or not and whether it seems like a, the right fit and whether we both want to move forward. As you were discussing, kind of sitting on the sales floor, making the call, I, I had a vision of Leonardo DiCaprio and the Wolf of Wall Street. I don't know if you have that reference, but maybe you're a more legit than Jordan Belfort, who it's based <laughs> on, and yes. the real estate recruiting equivalent of, of that. But anyway, that was what came to mind. I love the doing it in the open floor plan. That's really interesting. Once you get through kind of that whole phase, how do you close them and, and get them kind of started, so to speak, especially the, since you're hiring so many new agents? You know, kind of that first 90 days sounds, you know, is a critical period to to get them up and running to to success quickly so that they do, you know, produce and stick around and are successful. Well, so they usually decide pretty much on the spot whether they're going to join or not, right? I'd say 75% of the time they commit on the spot. 25% of the time it takes a little bit more follow-up, especially if they're moving from another brokerage or have deals in production that we've got to kind of balance around. It makes it a little bit more difficult. Onboarding, there's kind of two different paths, brand new or you know, very few sales or a little bit more experienced and kind of knows what they're doing. We run with a two-week, really intensive two-week onboarding here at the office that goes from 10 to 2, Monday through Friday for those first two weeks. We have a dedicated onboarder who works with our sales management team in works with the agents for the first 90 days. And onboarding is handled mostly by her, but our admin team takes over and does blocks of time. Our operations team, our marketing team, everybody kind of takes a little bit of the lift. And in the times when other folks are in, the onboarders got small groups going around accountability and refreshing and rehashing and that kind of stuff. After that, they jump into our normal training cadence for the remaining portion of the 90 days. But one-on-one -on -one coaching and small group mentoring are super important. We also have some really great agent um, mentors, our pod leaders that step in to help with writing first offers and who will take them through open houses and inspections and showings and that kind of stuff. We leverage Slack extensively and have a really great resource through keeping a lender and a closing attorney in Slack to help answer questions and be an additional point of reference for all of our folks. So you mentioned kind of a two-week training session. Like how often do you mm -hmm. do a cohort for that? Is that like kind of monthly or and every is there signing you trigger every week a two-week cohort. So they kind of there's always there's overlap between them and they're constantly sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we our lead gen is like I said pretty extensive. So we actually we hold to the standard of getting all of our new agents out showing homes their very first weekend. So getting them used to taking phone calls, knowing that most of them are going to mess it up, right? But they learn by doing. And yeah. if they don't get out there and make the mistakes, they're never going to actually learn. And so we, we hold those leads a little bit tighter for the first couple of weeks and don't give them a ton of opportunity or, you know, million plus dollar price points to club around with. But we know that they've got to fumble through how to use a lockbox and understand, you know, all of the awkwardness that comes sometimes with showings and whatnot. And so to get them their first appointment by that first week, are you giving them inbound leads or are they, is this outbound leads that they're prospecting in a list to generate those showings themselves? Like what kind of leads are you giving to them? So we, yeah, some of it's inbound from Zillow or Realtor.com or Google. We also have, like I said, a pretty extensive inside sales team of, I think there's six full-time reps right now who are constantly doing nurture from within our database and I think in any given week, they're booking between the team 60 to 70 appointments, both on the okay. buy side and the sell side. So we've always got opportunities ready for folks to hop into. Okay, great. So then what kind of goals do you set for them? You know, it's, you talked about kind of a training program and mentoring, but like what kind of, and you mentioned one, which was like, you need to be out at an appointment your first week. You know, how long do you consider that onboarding process to be? Is it, you know, 30, 60, 90 days? What And what goals specifically in terms of results and then maybe activity do you ask people to follow? And does it differ by new versus experienced agents or are the same goals for everyone? The same goals for everyone. Our goal is 
really to get them their first accepted offer within 45 days. We're a little bit seasonal in New England, so the winter gets a little bit trickier when inventory is super low and it's kind of winter market. But like right now, we'll we'll get there almost 90% of the time. If an agent doesn't get to their first accepted offer within about 90 days, we're going to put them back into the onboarding for one more 90-day spell. And if they still can't get an accepted offer, then we're going to have a conversation about whether it's the right fit. And so, so that's kind of the coaching aspect of helping, you know, agents be successful in retaining them. The other thing that is a pretty constant theme as we talk to people is just really keeping them engaged in the brokerage and office activities. What do you do there to kind of keep, and obviously beyond the 90 day period too, keep people kind of like build the esprit de corps, so to speak, get, keep them engaged in the brokerage and focused. So I think a lot of it, it's a, gosh, that's, I think one of the questions that every team leader and broker struggles with kind of on an ongoing basis. And I it kind of come down to, you know, culture across the board is definitely one aspect of it. Planning team building events is, you know, another, I think we all always try to do those kind of things. But I think making sure that we're communicating effectively and proving the value of why it's important to come to the office or engage, but also meeting people where they're at. Again, does the engagement always need to be in person? Maybe not. Hence why we leveraged Slack and some other virtual stuff from time to time. But also understanding that, again, I go back to right now where we are with the with the industry and all that's going on. There's a lot of reason. And my job and you know Jason's job, who manages the head of the agents for us, is to really help our agents understand what they need to know and how they need to navigate it and tell them the importance of kind of, I think, what's coming down the road over the next six months, right? I, I, I don't think anybody in the industry is naive enough to think that any, everything's going to remain status quo 12 months from now. So it, that I think is actually kind of helping us a bit to create engagement sure. and get people back in. Yeah. Good time. A lot of curiosity out there. So Facts. yeah, that makes sense. And so, you know, you talked about kind of that 90 day period or the first three months, which is a pretty common interval we hear, you know, in terms of onboarding and getting people to kind of success. You mentioned what's not a fit being someone who hasn't have a signed offer that by that point, but like, what do you like to see for people that are not just a fit, but folks that seem like they're going to be great at this, at that, at that point? Gosh, it, you know, it's so different. And I think defining great is, you know, really subjective, right? And I think one of my biggest learnings early on as a team leader or broker, I don't remember exactly where it happened is that I have to be super cognizant that my goals can't be the agent's goals, right? And the only way that I achieve my goals for the brokerage is when I help each of my agents achieve what their individual goals are. And so for some agents, that's selling six homes a year. For others, it's selling 30. And so defining success, I think, is what is success for that individual agent, given everything that they've got going on in their in their world. Well, that covers all my questions on how to kind of you know, guide agents through that talent funnel, so to speak. Maybe just a more general question here, which is just, you know, we have some people that are a little earlier in their career in terms of, you know, either starting as a team leader or starting a brokerage. Some are further along. But for the folks that are maybe a little earlier along, if you were to look back at, you know, earlier in your career, what are some of the tips that you would give your, your former self to get to where you are quicker? My favorite one is, Whenever I chat with folks who are new to recruiting and they're like, I can't recruit because I don't have your value prop. I don't have leads. I don't have a huge staff. I don't have, I don't have, right? My response is always the agent that joins me is never going to join you. And the agent that joins you is never going to join me. And so I think it's being super clear on what it is that you do offer and understanding that it is going to speak to some agents when you embrace it and sell it in the right way, right? The agent who's looking for one-on-one -on -one mentoring from a successful producing agent is never going to join my company because that's not me. I'm not going to hold your hand and take you out to a showing and to all of my listing appointments and teach you how I do absolutely every single part of a transaction. But that is important to some agents. And those agents that want that small, super family-like feel where it's a team of like four to 10 agents, are never going to join here, right? But conversely, the agent who wants what we have here is never going to join those teams, right? And Tom Ferry, my coach, uh, gave an analogy a couple of years ago, and I use this all the time, and it, it applies to all things sales, which is, you know, real estate, whether it be agents or brokerages or team leaders, it's like the potato chip aisle at the grocery store, right? There are hundreds of different kinds of potato chips, whether they're, you know, fried or baked, ridged or flat, right? 
dill pickle or sour cream and onion or just lightly salted. And everybody has one brand or one flavor that they really gravitate to all the time. And the reality is there's enough consumers for every single one of those hundred different kinds of potato chips and they all get equal shelf space, right? And every broker, every team leader, you just need to figure out who you are and how to sell to the person who's going to consume that. I love that answer, which is why, by the way, my favorite question I mentioned earlier is, do you, how do you know when an agent's not a fit and how do you handle that? What I've noticed, the reason is, what I've noticed is for broker owners that tend to be bigger, they tend to have a very concise answer on what is a fit and what is not. And they're willing to coach people that they're not a fit. And that in the smaller brokerage, as I see people more willing to just hire whoever, just to try to get some momentum and grow essentially. Okay, well, Lisa, thank you so much. That is my last question for today. But where, where could our listeners find you online if they had follow-up questions for you? Instagram is my favorite, Lisa Chinati. Super easy. It's where I usually hang out the most. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for offering up uh, your Instagram handle there, Lisa. And again, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me and our listeners today. And thanks to all the listeners for listening in. Please think about some of the, the things Lisa said today. I mean, a couple of gems in there are really at the end. Know who you are. Focus on that. And the other one was maybe pick out is I'm a big advocate of EOS as well. Pick up book traction if you haven't heard of it. Think about those couple of things. I'm sure there's some other gems too that you, you've you um, pulled out of there as well. Think about how you can put them to work in your business today. And please tune in in the future of the Broker Growth Accelerator for more podcasts and insight like this from other brokerage leaders. Thanks so much and have a great day. <music>